Like some of you have backslidden, but at least you're not like this side and don't even show up. <laughs> All right, well, let's get our hymn books and stand. We'll sing hymn number 369, Break Thou the Bread of Life. 369. Then shall all bondage 
If you want to come forward, we'll take our evening offering. We probably just need one. Yeah, we'll get it on one side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Father, we thank you for the lovely weather that you've sent our way yes, now. And we just pray, Father, that uh, you would uh, meet with us here tonight. And uh, we just pray you'd be with our pastor as he stands in the pulpit and breaks the bread of life. We pray, Father, that you would just... Uh, Help it to sink into our hearts, and Father, that we might uh, just use your word to uh, draw strength from it, encouragement, and, and grow closer to you. Pray, Father, you'd forgive us of our shortcomings. And, and Father, we pray that you'd bless those that are on our prayer list. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very thank you. Ah. Well, just a couple of things before we get into our lesson for the night. We want to remember our uh, events that are upcoming a week from this Sunday. We start revival. Amen. 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 Uh, I know that this year of pandemic makes everything seem to be spread out a long way, but uh, like it does to me every year when the pandemic ends and we start to open the church back up, uh, we get run over by the schedule. Uh, amen. So a week from this Sunday, we start revival. That means a week from this Saturday, we have prayer breakfast. Uh, and there's a sign up sheet there on the uh, uh, bulletin board. If you come into the prayer breakfast, please sign up so we know how many to cook for. And that's basically, oh yeah, the choir is going to sing this Sunday, I think. So uh, that's good news. Amen. And then I got a couple of prayer requests for you. We haven't got our prayer list going again yet, uh, but uh, we have a special prayer request from the Salazar family for their little granddaughter, Taylor. Taylor. Uh, she's a little four-year-old and she's had seizures for a good while and, and uh, they had her on medication and it was doing pretty well and they said that she had a seizure last night, was it? Uh, for over two minutes. Uh, so uh, keep her in your prayers. Her name is Taylor Salazar. Uh, and then also, if you would, uh, pray for Brother Tony. Uh, Brother Tony is in the uh, hospital down in Decatur. I've got a kind of a message here from, uh, from uh, Peggy and it just says, Prayer request for Tony Hoots. Most of y'all got this. He's in the hospital in Decatur with pneumonia in one lung and a fever. Uh, he does not have COVID. They checked him for that and he doesn't have that and that's good. But the doctors are checking him. Uh, he has an infection in his bone. Uh, and I think anytime you have a fever or a, an infection, you're probably going to have a fever. Uh, that's what indicates the infection. Uh, and they don't know what's causing that or what to do about it. Uh, and so uh, uh, what she's saying is they're going to try to figure that out while he's in there. And that's, that's a good thing to find out, amen, uh, what that's all about. Uh, and then uh, just pray for our church and the folks in our church. And uh, they would, I know, surely appreciate it. We're in the book of Matthew tonight, Matthew chapter 7. 
We had started last week dealing with that third problem uh, of believers that uh, can sidetrack us and draw us away from the fellowship of God when we become centered on who we are and not on who He is. When we become focused on the things of the world uh, rather than on the things of God. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, uh, and so we had found these three problems. We had found that there uh, is a problem when we become worldly mind minded, amen, and when we become self-sufficient and when we come, become self-righteous. And that's where we are tonight uh, on self-righteousness. And boy, we do tend to do that, do we not? Amen. We never seem to look at others uh, or ourselves as we look at others, amen. And we had started in uh, chapter 7, verse 1. We'd used that last week and we'd gotten over to verse 3. And I told you that tonight the title of our message would be Doing Eye Surgery. A blind man leading a blind man and a blind man doing eye surgery. Amen. I went, uh, uh, what day was it? Uh, Monday, I think it was. I had to go down to Weatherford and see my ophthalmologist. Uh, and and uh, I was excited. He came in uh, uh, and uh, he's a doctor. He was supposed to be investigating my eyes and he did well. Uh, they dilated him. It took me until 6, 7 o'clock Monday evening before I could see. Uh, but he came in and I'm telling you, he got some stuff out. Uh, and he put my head up in this vice thing and tied it in and put those things around. And I thought, now just a moment, he's going to say, we're going to deaden that eye a little bit more and shoot some needles in it. Uh, uh, but he didn't. He said, boy, your eye's better this year than it was last year. Amen. That's the kind of eye exam I like. Yeah. Uh, amen. Uh, uh, but I find here in Matthew, he's talking about when we become observers of others. And when we ourselves are blind uh, to the effects of sin in our own life, and yet we're willing and eager to seek them out in somebody else's life. Let's just read a few verses. We're going to read what we read last week, verse uh, 1 out of chapter 7, and then I'm going to read verse uh, uh, 3. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you uh, verse 6. When we get to verse 6, I've been saved a long time. I've read the Bible a lot of times. I have. I don't know how many. I can't stand up here like some people say, I've read the Bible 500 times, which probably haven't. Uh, but uh, uh, I couldn't tell you that. I've read through the Bible several times. Uh, amen. And verse 6 has always been kind of a, a, a dark spot. You know, sometimes you, read, you hit those verses that you have a little problem quite knowing how to deal with them. And so you just read through them real quickly. And so next year when you come back and you're reading Matthew 7, you know verse 6 is coming. So you read verse 5 and a little bit of them go right through 6 and get to 7. Uh, amen. And so doing this study, I've had to take some time and stop and look at verse 6. And uh, uh, it's been very interesting for me uh, to discern what that is talking about because it appears not to belong in the place that it's written. It's like they came up there and said, let's put something in here that, that, that's not relevant to anything else we're talking about. But it is. We'll get to that. Amen. So let's just read, if we might, verses 1 uh, down through verse 6. Judge not that you be not judged. Now understand, that's a commandment. And if we break that commandment, the penalty of breaking that commandment is already here. It says if we judge others, we will be judged. It's just like when God told uh, Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of the tree, here's what the penalty is going to be. It's set in stone. It's not going to change. This one here is called sowing and reaping. What you give to others is going to blow right back on you. Amen? I like that. Uh, verse 2, well, I, I like it for you. I don't much like it for me. Amen. But verse 2 says, For with, with what judgments you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, uh, but consider not uh, the beam uh, that is in your own eye? Or how will thou say to thy brother, pull, uh, uh, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Now, you know, I don't think I'd let that doctor or anybody come into that room where I was waiting for a man who was qualified to look in my eyes, come in there when he was walking with a stick, a blind man's stick, and he says, now I want to sit down and, and poke around in your eyeball, uh, uh, because this doctor went in there and actually put his finger, of course they had dead in my eye, uh, and put his finger on my eyeball and moved my eyeball with his finger. I said, that's not cool. You know, that's going to be, a, that's going to leave a sore spot. But it didn't. But anyway. Uh, uh, but you know, he's qualified. The Lord's saying here, we're not qualified to do his job. He's qualified. God's qualified. 
to judge men. We are not, and I'm not, uh, we are blind leading the blind. We've got no, uh, no permission to judge one another. Uh, uh, and then in verses 4 he says, Oh, how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold the beam that is a beam in, is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shall thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. What it means is that when you become spiritual, you can judge uh, or you can help a, a, a brother that's failed with the compassion of the Lord and not with the judgment of your own, of your own discernment. Amen. And then here's the verse that gives me trouble. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rent you. Now does that seem to fit what we just read to you? It's kind of out of place, isn't it? It's kind of like having your finger, your little finger over here where your thumb goes. It's just, you can see it, uh, but it just don't belong there. But it does. And I'll, I'll, I hope I can help you uh, see that when we get uh, through our lesson a little bit. And, uh, uh, but let me tell you how the devil works. This is just by, the Bible says uh, that we ought to confess things one to another, confess our faults one to the other. Be careful who you confess your faults to. Amen. Amen? Like those three preachers that was out in the boat, you know, and uh, they were talking, and uh, uh, one of them said to the other, we ought to just have a prayer session. He says, okay, let's just pray. He said, well, before we do that, let's all confess our faults, and then we'll pray about each other's faults. And the one said, well, you know, I have a real problem with my temper and my language. He said, well, we will pray about that. And the second one says, well, I have a real problem with, uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 alcohol and, and gambling. I've really been warring against that. And the third one says, uh, uh, well, I want you to know we got to get back to bank real quick because my problem is gossip. <laughs> amen. <laughs> well, at least you laughed. Amen. So uh, uh, it, it's easy for us to become judgmental of others because we're looking out of these two eyes and not looking into these two eyes. Amen. And so I want to uh, uh, just say that when we become self-righteous, that's what we're dealing here with, the self-righteousness that we can allow to spring up within us, uh, that we become uh, judgmental of others, just like the Pharisee who saw himself better than that, uh, that publican. Do you know how he discerned he was better than that publican? Because he perceived he was. He had made himself to be better than that publican. He was self-righteous and he became one who said, because I am righteous, I can judge others as unrighteousness. Amen? And so we're going to look at it. We judge uh, 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 others and we put ourselves in the place of God and we seal up our own judgment. Amen? God writes it down. How you deal with others, He will deal with you. And He'll let that come back. As my grandmother would say, He'll let the chickens come home to roost. Amen? This self-righteousness makes me eager to help somebody else see what's wrong with them. Listen to what He says. Look in verse 3. And why beholdest thou? I was coming into the office here, uh, I can't remember when it was. We've been in such a mess. This has been such a terrible day. I was going to tell you about that. The devil knew I was going to be preaching on judgment. And the, one of the side, what should we call it? One of the side effects. You know, when nowadays you go get a prescription or you see them on television and they say, take this drug. But here's all the side effects. You may get cancer. Your liver might fall out. Your tongue surely will rot off. Uh, but take this medicine. It's going to help you. And sometimes the, the cure is worse than the, the, the disease, amen? And, and, and I knew, uh, or, or the devil knew, that I'm going to be preaching on judgment, and I'm telling you one of the fruits of, of judgment is anger. When you see what somebody else is doing and you're saying, they ought not to do that, and I know they don't have a good reason, and they're just, and you get angry. Angry is the weakest form of argument against any abuse or anything in your life. It's anger. Amen. And so the devil knows who I am. He knows that sometimes <laughs> I deal with a little bit of anger. Uh, and today has been one of those days, knowing what I was going to preach on, knowing that when I get angry, it's because I'm judging the failure of others without having all the facts, without knowing what they're going through. But I'm judging the action of others that have made me, and I get angry at them because they didn't do what I thought they should. I've got a gentleman that's working for me. It's supposed to have been done in three to four days. I, while he's working at my house, I'm having the inside of my house painted. 
I've been staying over here in the apartment, mission house, because I thought it would be very convenient for him if my wife and I weren't there underfoot. So we brought some clothes, just, you know, Monday, Tuesday night, be back home Wednesday. This is what, uh, Thursday tomorrow? I'm still over there. And he's saying maybe Friday. That three or four days has turned in, if, it, if I get to go back on Friday, it's turned into eight days. <laughs> Amen. And, and of course, you know how my wife is. I say, that's just not good. And she says, now, baby, you don't know what he's dealing with. I know he's not dealing with my paintbrush. <laughs> Amen. So I, I dealt with that. Amen. And then I've, I've been trying to do business with, a, with some people. And uh, in order to do business with one group of people, I've got to get a clearance from another group of people. Amen. So I called them a week ago. And they say, three to four days, you'll get all the information, the paperwork you need. You can just pick, push a button and print it off. I called them today. Eight days later, I still don't have it. And you know what that does? That type of an attitude breeds within itself. It in one anger breeds another anger until you are just walking like this. Amen. And your wife walks up and says, I love you, sugar. No, you don't. Nobody loves me out there. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. That's exactly what God's talking about, that we have to be careful discerning the right or the wrong actions of other people because we are putting ourselves in danger. And he says, why, why are you looking at, this is what I saw. We went home for something. I think we went home to get some clothes. This is the same, y'all notice this is the same sports coat I wore last week? It's the only one I got. That's when we went to the mission house. was last Wednesday night. Hey, well, Wednesday afternoon. So I, uh, I've got the same jacket on. Sorry about that. It ain't bad. <laughs> Oh, I was supposed, oh, I didn't know you was up there, Miss Hasty. I know that as we were coming back in after we went out and got some clothes or did something, picked up the mail or whatever it was we did, as we were going out, just as you get off there off my road, there was a black hog, probably about a hundred pound little hog that had been run over, killed. And I told my wife, somebody's got some damage because he was big enough, he would have done some damage. And I said, now mark this down. Won't be long. Those vultures are going to be on him. Won't be long because they're flying all over Wise County looking for something that's dead. And it doesn't even have to be stinky yet. They like it to stink. That's how they find it. But if they see something laying there like that hog was, this is how he was. Don't take them long to come down and get on him. You know, a lot of believers do that. A lot of believers fly around. He said, why are you even looking? Did you read that? Read that first few words right there. Why are you looking? What are you looking to find? Do you know when you're looking out of these two eyes, there are eyes that are looking for someone to judge, all you're going to find is dead things. All you're going to find is things that stink, because that's what you're looking for. Good. Amen? Did you hear what he said? And why beholdest thou? You see, when you allow your eyes to begin to look at other people and judge them, you are sinning against yourself and against God. Yeah. Amen? So my day has proved to be somewhat difficult because I think the devil knew I was going to preach on judgment. Amen? Now, I'm going to, you know, confessing your faults one or the other, I might as well tell you the whole story. I can use me as an illustration because you know I'm just like you, and I know I'm just like you. So when I'm talking about me, I'm talking about you. <clears throat> I call this number that I called a few days ago in order to get the paperwork to take care of business. And the lady answers my call. And I think that call center must be in South Korea somewhere. Amen? because I could not understand what she was saying. I asked her every, every phrase, I had to ask her to repeat it. Uh, I put my phone on, on speaker and everything, trying to understand. Now understand, I don't have good hearing. And when you mix together bad hearing 
with bad English enunciation, it's disastrous. Amen. And I asked her on several occasions, can you not get somebody that can speak where I can understand them? And she says, no, and just went on. <laughs> I said, the second time, can you not get somebody that can speak where I can understand them? No, and went right on. So I said, hey, get somebody that can talk to me that I can understand. You know what she said? No. no. I'm not lying. Amen. So I hung up and called back. That's when I discerned that it wasn't one person that was having difficulty with English because the next guy I got was a, a, a gentleman and he spoke the same language she did. Anyway, long story short, it's been a long day. I know, that's what I said. Woe is me. That's what happens with self-righteousness. You always feel sorry for you. Sharon never feels sorry for me. I can't understand that. Why she can't feel my pain. Amen? But anyway, she doesn't. That ain't right, brother. No, it's not. So the Bible says, why are you looking? Why beholdest thou? Amen? So I want to take you on a little trip. We're going to go into a doctor's office, into a room, and we're going to set us all down around a wall, kind of like playing a game. And we're going to take turns. And I, I thought about this when that doctor was dealing with me because he's qualified. I could see his credentials hanging on the wall where he graduated from. He knew what he was doing. And I loved his report that my eyes were better this year than they were a year ago. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah. Amen. But what I want to do while we're sitting around that room is we're going to take turns. And I want you to get up, not literally, but in your mind, and walk around and look at each other. And look in their eyes. Now, it's one thing if you look in their ears. It's another thing if you look down their throat or up their nose. Well, they do. That's, that's embarrassing, too. But I want you to look in their eyes. Not just look in them. Check them out. Well, y'all all going, oh, you, I can't look in none of y'all's eyes. Look at all the glasses around here. Here, come here. I'll fix you up. Put your fingers on that eye that you're looking into and open it. Yeah. Now, take your finger and stick it in that eye and move it around to see if you can find that little old moat, that little old cinder that's in that person's eye. Anybody ever walk up and say, I've got something in my eye. Can you, can you find that? Can you find that? Can you find that? Well, sure. And the Lord says there is a possibility you can find it. The Bible says those of you who are spiritual come alongside him that has failed. See that problem that's in him, uh, realizing that except for the grace of God, that's you, Amen. and help him. Amen. Tick it out. But when I come alongside you and I'm looking in your eyeball, one by one by one, and I'm looking for something dead. That's what it says. Why are you looking? Did they ask for your help? Did they say, can you take this beam or this moat out of my eye? No, we don't usually have to ask. That's volunteered. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And then you look up while this person's about to help you with their little Kleenex to get that little moat out of your eye, and there's a stinking sliver this long sticking in the middle of their eyeball. <laughs> That's what it says. How can you help him when you haven't even helped yourself? Why are you looking? You don't have the vision to look into somebody else's eyes. You're not qualified to look into that. You can't solve their problem except God give you leadership. That means you've got to first look at you. Look over in James. <clears throat> I think you probably know where we're going. James chapter 2.
We'll read verse 22 down because I want to use that again here in a little while. It says, But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Listen to me. A self-righteous man is deceiving him own self. He's deceiving himself concerning his righteousness, concerning his holiness, concerning his doing right uh, when everybody else is doing wrong. I remember when I was in the army, uh, uh, there was a, a kind of a, a story about, you know, you, the army wants you to all walk in, say, in step, they call it. They want you to be in step. You've got a whole battalion of men, and you've got somebody out there calling cadence, lip, 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 right, lip, 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 right, lip. And you got one guy in the outfit that's always out of step. And we had one. He was a great big tall boy, about 6'4", so just a big skinny farm boy. It's what he was. He was probably 18 years old. And nowhere we went. And, and when he walked, he walked like this. <laughs> Ain't no way he could stay in step. He stepped, he stepped out four and a half yards at a time. <laughs> Amen? And the, the uh, platoon sergeant made us all stop. You know, halt. We all stopped. And he walked over and he says, whatever the guy's name, I don't remember. He said, I'm so proud of you. All these other 69 men were out of step, but you were right on, right on step. <laughs> Amen? And when he would say, right face this boy ever, forever would turn in the wrong direction. Amen? In fact, it was so bad. And when we'd step off, he'd say, forward, hard, live, live, live. You always step off your left foot. He didn't. That's how he got out of step, I guess. <laughs> Platoon sergeant finally went over and picked up a rock and brought it back over and put it in his right hand. And he says, where this rock is, is your right hand. When I say lip, right, that's where your rock is. And for the rest of basic training, that big tall boy, and he finally got out of basic, carried a rock in his hand every day. So he'd know which way to turn when he said right. Amen? When we become righteous... We become not doers of the word, but the judge of the word. Listen to what he says. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Now that glass means a mirror glass. Amen. Something that reflects. Amen. For he beholdeth himself, and that's a good thing. You say, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's a good and a bad thing. <clears throat> when you behold yourself in a mirror, sometimes it is good, is it not? Have you ever tried to shave without a mirror? I know people that do it. I know people that shave in a shower uh, just while they're wet. They just take their razor and do like this. I'd cut my nose off. I need a mirror, especially as I'm getting older, because this face isn't like it used to be. I've got a little bit of a few fat places. I've got one right here where my eyeball kind of slides down to like this. Like. It didn't used to do that. It used to be kind of tucked up. Now I'm just kind of pudgy right there. And when I'm shaving, if I'm not watching myself in the mirror, I'll go and I'll cut that right there every time. I've got another one right here. And I don't know why, but this is where if, I'm, if I come in and I got toilet paper all over my face, it'll be right here and right there. Amen. I need to see a mirror because it reflects who I truly am. And when I'm looking in that mirror, it makes me cautious about what I see. I know where those spots are and I watch for them so that I can shave. And I, I have a beard that's bad enough. I shave this way. I shave this way. I shave this way. I shave every which way. Amen. To try to get the whiskers off. Amen. But it's good to look in a mirror so you can see what kind of man you are, what you're shaving. Because you don't look like you did 40 years ago, Wally. You probably had hair 40 years ago. Still do have some of it. I guess you just got it cut off, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, just got her cut off. For a man 70, 80 years old, you look pretty good. <laughs> I went back. I, I have it in my computer, actually, some pictures. I've got a picture of me when I was uh, 17 years old in my Army uniform that they, you know, they take a picture of you when you first get your first dress, uh, dress uniform. And I've got that picture. And I look at that and I think, who in the world is that? It looks like a little kid. It seriously looks like a little kid. And I look in the mirror 
I don't expect to see that. I've, I've looked in the mirror every morning for these 45 years, and I've seen the change so gradual that if I looked in the mirror and saw that picture, I'd, I'd say, that's not me. Because we're looking in the mirror to see who we are that we might be properly aware of our own countenance. Amen? And the Bible says uh, that we ought to be uh, uh, aware when we look into the Word and see what we are. And the Word here he's talking about is the Word of God. When we're looking into the mirror of the Word of God, we go into the Word of God to see what manner we are, of man we are, not what manner of man you are. So that I, as I continue in the Word of God, know every day who I am and what my failures are and what a weak and terrible person I am and before God in the glory of God. So therefore, uh, that I'm not too concerned about judging you, I'm still dealing with me. And if somebody comes and says, now listen to me, I learned this a long time ago. And, and I've had people say this to me, okay, here at this church. Brother Gary, you're going to be me for a second. Preacher, do you know Wally's having some problems? You probably ought to go see Wally and talk to him about that. Do you know what they call it when you go try to help somebody that didn't ask for your help? Button in. Do you know how much people like that? Zero. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean that when you're praying that God doesn't lay somebody on your heart to pray about and somebody that you might want to go over and uh, say, Brother Wally, uh, is there anything I can help you with? I, I, I kind of by your countenance tell that you're kind of under a burden. Can I pray for something with you? That's okay. But when you walk up and say, Wally, I know you're having some trouble. Old sister such and such told me you were uh, having a problem drinking again. I thought I'd come over and talk to you about that. Baby, okay? Can I tell you his answer? I hope you don't drink. <laughs> if you do, that's God, not me. <laughs> but he says, He beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forget what manner of man he is. See, when I forget what manner of man I am, I don't have any trouble judging you. Amen? Amen. But whosoever, verse 25, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. Now, so let me tell you right now, right over in the flyleaf of your Bible, the perfect law of liberty is Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the perfect law, and by that perfection of law, He gives us liberty. We are set free from the law because He is the perfect law. The perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he be, be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Uh oh. Now go back over to Matthew chapter 7. And he says, Oh, how wilt thou say to thy brother? Now notice. The brother didn't ask for help. Here's somebody that's beholding. He's looking around, looking for a problem, looking for something that's stinking. He says, hey, brother, I can see you're in trouble. Let me help you. First thing you ought to ask him, when, who died and made you judge? Can I, can I ask you, are you prayed up? Are you right with God? But anyway, he says, uh, uh, let me pull out the moat out of thine own eye, and beholdeth a beam is in your eye. How can you help me when you're in worse condition than I am? Amen. And this is what the Lord says, but thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam, get the problem out of your life so you can see clearly that his problem isn't nearly as bad as you want to make it out to be. Get it out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast, how do you get the beam out of your eye? How do you get fault out of, your, out of your life? When you fail, how do you deal with it? By confessing it. Getting right with God. When you're right with God, you can help somebody that's not. Amen? Because you'll do it in compassion. I found out something. I, I, I'm not telling you that experience is something we ought to desire. Okay? Because I don't think you have to have a testimony of sin to walk in holiness. I mean, I know people that say, well, i got to go out and live in sin for a while, so I'll have a good testimony when I get right with God. 
Amen. The best testimony is no testimony at all. It's where you can say, I was raised in a godly home by godly parents. I was saved at a young age, and I've walked with God uh, uh, by His grace. I am what I am, uh, and I do the best I can. And you, you, you have no testimony of 25 years in a honky-tonk or in, in doing drugs or, or in out, coming out of rehab or getting saved in the pen. You don't have any of those testimonies because every one of those testimonies is ammunition for the devil. Yep. Amen. Amen. God may have cleaned you up but you've got to remember that old man is in there and he remembers everything you used to be. So we ought not to desire testimony. We ought to desire to be in holiness. And when I'm prayed up and I'm right with God, I'm dealing first with me. And I'm dealing with you only by invitation. I hope you get that. Now, I do know that some by the Spirit of God, we are given leadership. But if God says to you, you need to go over and talk to David. He's just not treating Marty right. Amen. <laughs> we know, don't we, David? We know. We know. Yes, I've known David a long time, and Marty, we know. <laughs> but David's just not treating Marty right. And you pray about it. God has really burdened you about it. You better get real prayed up. And you better go in the gentleness and the kindness of God. Because you may come away with a fat lip. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Amen. Amen. But judging ourself first. I know this is hard, but we ought to be our worst our worst critic, spiritually speaking. Amen. Amen. If I ask you this, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, who would you consider in this church, am I on? Oh, okay. Who would you consider in this church to be godly? Oh, I see. You want her to fan you. Now, we're talking about how bad Marty is, aren't we? I think she may spoil you just a little bit. Who would you consider to be the best person in this church on a scale of 1 to 10? Don't tell me. Somebody that you would feel like that if you had a problem in your life, they are walking with God, that you'd feel comfortable to go over and say, can you pray with me about this or can you help me with this problem? If you're the first name on the list, something's wrong. Amen? Amen? And if somebody came in and said to you, Mr. Cola, can you pray with me? I know you're a spiritual lady and you love the Lord and I, I'm just having some problems. Can I help you? Uh, the first thing out of your mouth is, <laughs> you bet you, buddy, I'm ready for this. I've got this thing locked up. Watch this. I can help you. No, the first thing you're going to say, are you sure, brother? I'm having problems. I've got problems every day in my own life. But if God gives you opportunity and you get prayed up and you help somebody with compassion and tenderness, considering your own self, not as his judge, but as a testimony of the same failure in your life that's in his. That's hard stuff, isn't it? Amen. I'd rather judge you than help you. <laughs> isn't that, that's the truth. Amen? I've figured out that my wife can't drive. That's true. She says she, th she can, but she just can't. She drives terrible. Every time she gets under the wheel, it scares me to death. And the other day we were talking about this because she was driving for some, we were in her car, that's what it was. And uh, she was driving and I'm telling you, she runs up on a stop sign and about three feet from it, she stops. <laughs> Man, if the brakes ever fail in that car, we're gonna kill somebody, amen? And she talks instead of paying attention. <laughs> you know, when you look, when you're driving and you look over like this and you carry on a conversation for a one minute, you haven't looked forward, that's not safe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, she does that. She will actually, I shouldn't tell this on her, she'll actually drive into town from our house putting her makeup on while she's coming in here. <laughs> And when I'm driving, she does it every time. That's how she, that's when she puts on her makeup in the car, sitting on the driver's side. But the lady can't drive. She scares me. 
<clears throat> and then I stopped and I thought, you think you're a really good driver, and I do think I am. So I started watching me. <laughs> you know those little bumps on the side of the highway? You know why they put those on there for us good drivers? How many times have you hit that? They put them down the middle now, too. Did you notice that? I can be going out the house. I figured out. I'm not any better driver than her. I'm just used to me. <laughs> but I wonder how much grace it takes for her over these 13, 15 years, I think, whatever it is, 15 years of riding everywhere we go with me. Because I don't drive any better than she does. I'm just used to me. Just like I told her, if I have a wreck and kill us, it's my fault. You have a wreck and kill us, shame on me. You shouldn't even be under the wheel. And I do most of the driving. I really do. I don't, I don't, she don't drive much. But you got to know my wife can go to sleep between here and that back door. <laughs> she can just doze off in mid-step. She really can. When we first got married, she left to go down to, to, she was going to Denton to see somebody. I don't remember who it was, one of her friends or something. And my nephews had told me when I married their mother, you got to watch her. She goes to sleep at the wheel. She's been out in the middle of the field, folks, before when she just went to sleep and went through a barbed wire fence and went out in the middle of the field. And she going to Denton. I said, okay. We hadn't been married very long. She called me from Decatur, 10 miles. And she said, baby, and this is when we were living out in Bill Higgins' old house. So it really wasn't even 10 miles, about eight. She said, baby, I'm coming home. I said, I thought you was going to Denton. She said, I can't stay awake. I'm serious. And, and I'm going to ride with that? <laughs> But before I start fixing how you drive, maybe I ought to consider how I drive. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. I know. I didn't mean to say it. I didn't want to say it. He says, he says when we do that, verse 5 addresses us, thou hypocrites. He says, how can you judge something in somebody else that you're doing yourself? You're laying up judgment for yourself because you're just as guilty as he is. And I'm telling you, there is nothing that a Christian can't do but go to hell. Amen? Amen. So we got to be careful judging one another. Amen. Oh, I've got to hurry. Now go to my favorite verse, verse 6. <laughs> Give not that which is holy unto dogs, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under fi their feet, and turn again, now underline this part, and turn again and rent you. Help me, what do you think that means? You can't answer, Brother Irwin. Huh? Come after you. What do you do with this casting your pearls beneath swine? Huh? Let go of your dirt. Oh, oh, yeah, got you, got you. You understand that every believer is a lighthouse in a dark world. The day you get saved, you're a part of the army of God. And we have, the, we have a message of grace. Amen? And it's our job to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen? That's our job, is it not? Amen. And yet oftentimes, this pearl of great price, that's what the Old Testament calls Jesus, the pearl of great price. This pearl of great price is compromised in the world by us. Yeah. Amen? And we go out and behave ourselves as a judge, judging other people, condemning what they do, being angry at them. Because you figured out they're not doing what they should do, and they're not doing it the way you want them to. That's my problem. And so you kind of let that know that. And then you come back, maybe on Saturday. You go out on visitation to tell them about 
this great pearl that you know, to tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ when they've seen your judgment, when they've seen you put them down, Amen. when they've seen you judge other men and see the same failure in you. Hold that thought. I'll come back, back to it in just a second. <clears throat> right after I got saved, I had a gentleman in my, that was a friend of mine that we'd been out of town with oftentimes working for Western. We'd go out uh, like at this particular time, we were down in the valley, down in Harlingen. We were down there for almost a year. And we'd stay down there two, three weeks at a time, then we'd come home. We had three or four of us got an apartment together and we lived together. This is way back before I was saved. In those days, I really did enjoy drinking. And I would, a lot of times, I would actually stay out of town extra weeks so I could continue my drinking because when I came home, my first wife didn't like, didn't like that. And this gentleman, I'm not going to use his name because this is going to go out over YouTube and he'd know who he was. Well, he knows who he is anyway, but I don't want anybody else to know it. And I got saved. And I said, I knew exactly who I needed to go talk to. I think I was telling you about this. That's why I'm using the illustration. I told Brother Irwin this story when we was going down to uh, Ennis the other day. And I got saved and I thought, man, I know somebody that needs to get saved. Because every place I went, sitting right in that bar stool right next to me. That's who he, that was him. And we did it week in and week out. So I went over. I knocked on his door. I said, brother, I need to talk to you. I said, now I don't know everything. I don't know a lot about this. All I do know is that God saved sinners and he saved me. And I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. And you know what he said to me? He said, well, brother, I've been saved since I was 14 or 10 or something. I got ticked. Now, remember, I just got saved. I said, you're what? Casting your pearls against under the feet of swine? I said, you're what? You saved? And we've been doing this for all these years together. We've been friends in the honky-tonk. We've been doing all this. And you were going to let me die and go to hell? You knew who Jesus was? That's what he's talking about. When you become the judge, you shut your testimony off. And then you go back with your judgmental self-righteous self and try to tell them about Jesus and they will not hear it from you. Yeah. That was, by the way, I had known that young man. We had been friends for almost 10 years. Never went on another transfer with him. Never had much to do with him. I know that wasn't properly the right way to handle it, but I was very young in the Lord, and all I knew was that man was willing to let me go to hell so he could go out and do whatever he wanted to and come home and, and go to church and be that Sunday Christian. That's what that verse is talking about. When you take your gospel and allow it, by your judgmental attitude, by your anger, by your self-judgment, by the things you do that put out the light of God uh, that the whole world sees. And then you go back and say, now let me tell you about Jesus. They'll say, you kidding? You're not telling me about Jesus. And you will make them angry. Inconsistency is the most devastating thing in the world to our testimony with Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the next time you read this, you won't have to skip that verse. <clears throat> he says, at least they trample them under their feet. That is the pearl that, uh, uh, that you are, uh, uh, the, the testimony of the Lord. At least they trample them under their feet and turn again and rent you. Now, it didn't say that, that the pearl ceased to be the pearl. It says those that are speaking it, they're going to rent you because of your inconsistency. Amen. Well, as we come to Matthew chapter 7 next week, we're going to go into verse 7 and 8. These are verses that we hear so frequently preached. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Amen? Isn't that a good verse? Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He's now going to go back and tie us back into Matthew chapter 6, verses over here, verses 8, when it's talking about praying. Ask, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened. 
ask. I've done that. Lord, I would like to have more money. And honestly, I don't care how I get it. If that's not true, I do. I'm not going to go rob a bank. Lord, I'd like to have a house. Even if you don't want me to have it, I want it. So when you pray, God, give me that house, you understand this asking and knocking has to do with the will of God. Not to fulfill the lust of your flesh, but in order to see the sufficiency of God's grace in your life day by day in the, in the things of our life. Because God's going to promise, God promises He'll take care of His children. We've never seen God's children begging for bread. Amen. Okay? Well, if God's going to take care of me, why do I ask? Why do I knock? Why bother? <clears throat> if you came in from a good home, I know some kids don't. I'm almost through. Just give me a moment. We, you still got time. Teens ain't out. If you came from a good home where mother and father were both there, you were, married, you were raised up in a, in a family with mother and father, did you ever come to the dinner table? And when I was a kid, we ate at the dinner table. We ate supper at the dinner table. Primarily because we had just gotten a TV in 1957. There was only two channels, and they were only on about two hours a day. <laughs> but you sat down at the table, and you said, uh, Daddy, feed me. What do you think he was there for? Hey, Pop. I want something to eat. Did you go and ask Daddy to feed you every, every evening? You expected him to feed you, didn't you? Then what's he talking about? He says, ask and it shall be given unto thee. Knock and it will be opened to you. Hmm. We're going to look at that next week. You'll have to come back next week to find out. <clears throat> if you would, stand with me. We're going to have a word of prayer and a short invitation, and then we'll let you out. You ought to be getting out just about the time the youth department does. Lord God, we do thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for this Sermon on the Mount that we've enjoyed, Lord, and we've seen uh, so much greatness in it. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to take it to heart and that we would not be judges of others because it does condemn ourselves, And that, Lord, we would realize that our testimony is important. How we behave ourselves in the world is important to the testimony that we want to share with the lost and dying world. And Lord God, that we ought not to compromise that testimony. Bless now uh, this short invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.